<laughs> Morning, everybody, and welcome to Edge Talks. It's great to see so many of you here today, and we've got an exciting session today with Alison Cameron. So, just to remind everybody, there's several ways you can join our um, session today. We've got the chat room, so make use of that. And you can also join via Twitter using the hashtag EdgeTalks. So, um, and later on, there will be discussion um, with the School and Health and Care Radicals. Um, and a reminder, on Wednesday at 4 p.m., we'll be following with, we'll be having a Twitter chat following this session. So, as I said, the session today, we've got um, Alison, um, and as normal, we'll be running um, chat room monitor, and this, this session will be Dom, so thank you, Dom, and Carol will be our Twitter monitor. And, and today, we have two other colleagues joining us. Um, we've got um, Rachel and Becky, who we'll be introducing later, but it's great that they can join us today, so thank you. So, if we're all ready, I shall hand over, we're sharing the computer with Alison, so I'll quickly turn the computer to Alison, and then we're ready to go. So. <laughs> Thank you. Gosh, the wonders of technology. This is extremely out of my comfort zone, just letting you know that. What am I going to talk about? Let's think. Um, I want to talk about one of the themes um, of The Edge, really. I'm sure you're all subscribers to The Edge. If you're not, you need to be. Um, about change agents. Who, in fact, are the change agents? Um, when we think about change agents, are we still tending to look within organizations, within our organizations? And what about those who are not actually part of the official hierarchy that may not even have a job title? Um, those outsiders who are very interested in the work that we do but aren't necessarily being paid to do it. I'm, of course, talking about, uh, well, I'll use the word patients for now. Um, are we still seeing patients as bundles of needs to be met by others or as potentially part of the solution? Uh, this is um, what I'm going to be talking about how I myself have managed to move from a kind of passion, passive uh, patient uh, state to what I would uh, dare to call patient leader and how challenging this, this has been um, and it, because it's involved coming out of boxes and that uh, applies to me personally as well. Uh, the caveat would be um, I am talking generally within a healthcare context so uh, the word patient is, is for that reason. This is because the, my personal experience does come largely from my extended uh, experience of, of having a health condition. So um, patients here, I mean those of us who've had a really life-changing extended interaction with the healthcare and social care systems. Um, I'm not necessarily referring to people who've visited their GP to have a boil lanced, for example. I'm sure that needs to be a good experience too. But uh, it's just uh, when I hear we are all patients, I just want you to, to, to bear in mind that's yes and no. Um, I would really hope we don't get sidetracked on the semantics. So I thought what I might do is actually not use a word at all that anyone would write. I might just use the word blob. And you can all put in the service user, carer, citizen, customer, whichever you're most comfortable with. It's entirely up to you. I quite like blobs myself. Um, so I want to talk about, with the time we've got today, is introduce the idea of us blobs less as passive recipients of care, sources of data, experiences to be captured, and more as active partners in the leadership task itself. Uh, when we think of change agents in, in healthcare, I'd like us to question the idea that that's solely limited to those of us with formal positions within the organization. I know it's difficult. Um, very often, those with most freedom to work in new and radical ways are, in fact, the outsiders inside. We have more power to look outwards because we don't have to look up or behind our backs all the time, necessarily. Right. Thank you. 
I'm not exactly technolo technologically minded, I can't even say the word, but I might do it. Um, this is uh, an adaptation of the Einstein's Ladder of Engagement, with which I'm sure a lot of people are familiar. Um, it's a version I like um, that was put together by the New Economics Foundation. Um, because it mentions co-production. And what I've added here is what I've, I've come through my own experience of the finance, the different levels um, of blob engagement. So uh, from, from passive through uh, passive voice up to leadership. And a lot of these levels are, are essential and they're each, they're each as, as valid as, as the others. So it's not to say that I'm denigrating any of the activities, the fantastic activities that go on under, say, patient voice where you invite people into focus groups and so on. That, kind of, that stuff needs to go on and needs to be done well and meaningfully, but it's just to get over the idea that actually there is further that, uh, that, that we can all go together if, if the conditions are right for all of us. It gets more challenging as power shifts as we go up the ladder, but it, it is fun. And also, it's, it's, it, you can go up and down. It doesn't have to be just, uh, you know, just depending on the nature of the bit of work that you're doing. So there's not going to be much by way of theory apart from this in this uh, <laughs> presentation because it's not really my style. Um, it, so uh, what I really hope to do is get over there. It's not really about models. There's rafts of stuff online about this. You just need to Google Arnstein co-production and you, you'll find stuff. But this is about hopefully getting over the mindset. Um, it's actually about mindsets rather than, than models. If you get that right first, you can then go on to develop models that actually stand a chance of working. Um, so I'm going to present my own, I do love talking about myself, you know, and this is one hell of an audience. I can't see anyone, so I have no idea how, who's out there and how many. It's really strange, but anyway, um, I'll talk to my therapist later. I've got a session booked right after, just in case. They're on in the next room with the rhino dart. Um, so, uh, yeah, so I'm going to uh, present myself really as a case study. Um, and, it, you know, as I say, it's going to be roughly on the, on the subject of, of, of boxes. So I'll talk about that through, throughout. Oh, I cannot get the slides going in the right direction. There we go. Um, right. The question, who am I? Uh, well, I certainly... Gosh, I can't... Work with. Back. No, that's fine. Uh, sorry about this. I'm technically inept. Um, Nerve-wracking as well, this is. Uh, I, I, thank you. I knew who I was. I was defined by my job title. Um, I had a, a pretty high-powered, on the face of it, career. Um, but it was a bullying culture. It was very hierarchical, very uh, political, uh, with a small and large P. Uh, and uh, I cared very deeply uh, about what I was doing. It was international development with a lot of uh, emphasis on humanitarian uh, aid and cultural links, etc. about partnerships and collaboration, really. Um, and I cared deeply about what I was doing, but the culture within my organization factored against me being able to do that to the best of my ability. And that's not a nice place to be in, really. Um, the, 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 one of the reasons I talk about this now is that the, the seeds of thinking that I now utilize in the work I, I now do, it started then. It didn't start with illness. It's, uh, you know, we, we blobs have uh, had a life outside, outside of our uh, diagnoses, and mine happened to be in this work. Um, I'm a Russian graduate, so I was sent early on to work on projects around the uh, uh, Chernobyl nuclear disaster, which happened in 86, but from 1990 I was sent into the zone, um, ostensibly to find out ways in which we, with the power and the money, could help those victims, uh, uh, those poor victims out uh, in those countries. But when I went to those communities, I did not see victims. I saw people starting to get together. Um, the Soviet Union was coming to, to, to an end, and they were starting to form their own solutions to their own problems. The resources were there, and we were, in, we were part of negating, of negating those resources. Uh, the, uh, the images of the time 
Um, these are quite distressing, of course, but they, their, their aim was really to raise money. It was all very well-meaning. Uh, the, these, these are not positive images. <laughs> the, these don't reflect the people that I got to know in those areas. So there we have another example now. Um, uh, just to show you what I mean, here is a bit of a contrast. Now, this is Maria Sharapova. Maria, um, Maria's parents were living in that city that I worked in. That's the city of Homil in the Republic of Belarus. 70% of the radiation from Chernobyl fell in Belarus, and 70% of that in Homil region. Um, uh, Sharapova was born in 1987, so one year after the disaster. Um, her parents had decided to flee to uh, the east to, 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 to escape from the, you know, the unknown dangers, really, of the radiation. So if anyone is a Chernobyl child, Maria Sharapova is, and I can tell you she does not fit the victim image, does she? I know a lot of people who have been labeled as uh, victims of Chernobyl, and none of them fit the, the, the thing. Now, I read a report from an international development agency that one of the effects of a lot of the humanitarian aid at that time was to create a passivity a culture, a victim culture, people just not having faith in their own abilities. And I, I, I really, really identified with this. And, and in fact, it was the same in Ukraine. Um, Ukrainians are not passive. We know this from Maidan. There are some uh, people protesting on Maidan Square. Slava Ukraini. And this is a lovely image of the piano player at Maidan uh, in front of a uh, riot uh, shield. So again, these, the, you know, de depicting people as, as, as helpless, defense, defenseless, and victims is not uh, necessarily doing them any favors. I was to realize myself that my thinking was, was right because I became, I entered my own exclusion zone. If I ever write a book, I think I might call it this. This is the uh, Chernobyl zone in, in Ukraine, I think that is. Uh, and um, I uh, became uh, ill myself uh, working on one of my projects in Belarus, not connected with Chernobyl. It was an environmental project. My colleagues were killed, and um, I was required to sort out the re repatriation of bodies to this country. And uh, it kind of, um, I was already very stressed. I understand about burnout that happens in, uh, in NHS settings because I was there myself. And the thing that pushed me over the edge was being expected to remain silent about really what happened, what actually happened to my colleagues. I was told I had an overdeveloped commitment to honesty and that um, uh, didn't do me any favor. So um, ultimately I became, um, I became very ill. Um, I, I was so devoted to my work that I carried on working well beyond um, the time when uh, it was healthy for me to do so. And I, and I did that by um, medicating with alcohol, which ultimately nearly killed me. So I kind of fell off the edge of a cliff. Uh, I think I was probably teetering on the edge for a while anyway. But th this was the thing, not anything horrific. I, I, the, the people in Belarus all got together. We had trusting relationships with the people there. The, what they did to, to get the bodies back to this country was amazing. And uh, I, I remain really grateful to all of them. It was about the not being able to talk about it was the, one of the worst uh, consequences for me. So I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress. These are some of the new labels that I, I acquired. I, I got rid of my, my, my job title and I got these instead. Um, I'm rather fond of Maelstrom of Mayhem. This was a young doctor in um, University College Hospital. I was by this time homeless. I was uh, completely zonked out of my mind with, with alcohol, which I would either just buy or steal if I had to. You know, it was not a very nice time. And I, I was sleeping in a car park. I was sleeping in the car park of Kensington Town Hall, which proves that I always had, uh, always had some, some standards. I only, only dust in the posh areas of, of London, obviously. Um, I was in hospital so often. I was on, in hospital on a, like a two-week loop because um, I was just, uh, my, I had nowhere stable to live. It was totally unsafe. Uh, I had these terrible symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, which I was blanking out with alcohol and then blanking out the reality that it had all gone. My job had gone. My home had gone. Everything had gone. And in fact, I thought my entire identity had gone. Uh, 
So I, I reckon I had, uh, the, this is I think my, my role of dishonour, um, I think uh, that it could be different because I don't remember much about it, but I, I do know there's about 100 uh, acute hospital admissions. If I've been in any of your hospitals, anyone here uh, joining in, I do apologise for my, my conduct, I'm, I'm making up for it now hopefully. Um, so you know, that's costing a lot, that's costing a lot to me as a human being and it's costing a lot to the system. Um, and you know, uh, there we have it. I would like to get some, some bean counting person to actually tot up how much that costs. Um, I got through it by either fragmenting myself or, or, um, or just becoming, just maintaining the passivity. So to save energy, just stay in the revolving doors and that way, you know, save some energy. I certainly didn't need my brain anymore. I like this, this cartoon from the United States. Um, this uh, I've made deliberately made um, hospital green. <laughs> um, I, I had very little, inter on long admissions, I had very little interaction with the uh, human race other than being bellowed at to take, to take medication and, and whatnot. It was, it was, you know, if you'd have asked me what my experience, my opinion was and whether, you know, I could be part of co-producing something at this stage, you know, I just, just thought you were having a laugh, frankly, I told you to shove up your kilt at best, because uh, I really was that, that non-compliant. Uh, this was, or obnoxious is probably more, <laughs> more accurate. Um, it was like this, it's like which way's up, it's a sort of Escher-like reality that I became in. And the maze, you know, it's bad enough if you're, um, you have clarity in your mind to cope with things like housing, benefits, you know, the maze or bits of, you know, the substance misuse services felt that I was too mad for them. And the, the, uh, the mental health services felt that because of the extent of my drinking, I wasn't appropriate for them. Um, and, you know, meanwhile, social services and, and housing were like, operating on, a, on another planet, it sometimes uh, felt. So for anyone, that would be hard enough. But for someone in a kind of um, frozen state like I was in, it was, it was uh, next, next, it was, there was a lot of luck involved in, in my survival. Um, I certainly lost my identity. When I, when I speak to people with a whole range of long-term health conditions that they've suddenly had to come to terms with. One thing that seems to unite all of us is the, is the impact of the identity loss, and I'm not sure that enough is done, at least it certainly wasn't in those days, to, to help us with that, that the people we thought we were, just think for a moment, if you're in a job and you're in a, you kind of roughly know where you're going to go with your career and everything else, you're perhaps in a pay grade, you know if you stay around long enough, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. Imagine if all that just suddenly was swept away. That, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to, 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 have, to, to have to deal with um, for, for anybody. Certainly any abilities I had, any, anything, anything about capabilities, uh, anything that wasn't about needs to be met or behaviors to contain or any of those things, anything that was about ability and any strengths, uh, they were probably still there, but they were cryogenically suspended in a different room and I didn't have the key to the room. Uh, somebody else had a key, <laughs> and I, I was yet to find who that, that person was. Um, yeah, a lot of the care was fantastic. It was safe. It kept me safe, and sometimes that was all you could do with me in the state I was in, to be perfectly honest. Um, the, there were unsafe bits, and they were the gaps that I would fall through, the gaps between particularly with housing, uh, you know, getting dispatched off to a condemned building in Tottenham, North London. I don't, if people don't know Tottenham, it's pretty hard to be a condemned building in Tottenham. But I managed to get put to one. And, uh, you know, some pretty horrific things happened to me there because I was very vulnerable. Um, so there was that. There was the good care, but the good care that was also wrapping me in, in bubble wrap so that I didn't have to necessarily make any decisions for myself. And I certainly didn't have to contemplate anything like anything like a, a future, you know, it was, uh, I, 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 I assumed at best my future was going to be about being kept safe, being kept safe from myself, really, fundamentally. Um, it was in a way, it became a comfort zone. 
I loved. There was a, a psychiatric hospital, like a posh one that had rock stars in it and stuff. Um, and the NHS had a contract in there, and I used to get sent there on occasion. And it was just great because I got filled full of Valium, and I didn't. And, I, and there was a nice chef and stuff. And I didn't have to think about anything. It was just fantastic. But the great problem with comfort zones is they can look very fantastic, but very rarely does anything grow there. Now, at this time, of course, I, I would have assumed I was being buried, but what I now know is, in fact, I was being planted. Um, characteristic of uh, what I've experienced is that I met some amazing people along the way, some of them professionals, some of them uh, people from uh, uh, blobs, um, and, 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 they, and they had said or did the right thing at the, at the right time. They were exactly in the right place when I was ready uh, to, to, to hear it. One of these was uh, Dr. Rachel Perkins, who um, um, was a consultant psychologist, clinical psychologist, and was diagnosed bipolar. And uh, rather than it being the end of her life, uh, her active life, it, it really enhanced her work and, and it, 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 that she added the insight. So it became an asset. Uh, and I, I, I heard her speak because I drifted by chance into a meeting of a, a mental health charity in my borough. Um, and there in the toilets, I was chatting to a very nice lady in pearls, as, as you do. Uh, and she was asking about myself, and I told her my observations about the disconnection between substance misuse and mental health services and whatever else. I didn't realize that was uh, Dame Ruth Runciman, who's chairman of Central North West, West London NHS Foundation Trust at that time. Um, and she got me in to open the door into the fantastic world of service user stroke patient involvement. Um, now, uh, that was really useful uh, for me because it got me some routine and it made me feel I was actually doing something of use and, uh, um, you know, it, it's not something, it, it, not something I would be dissing in any way, but, you know, after the first few years and nothing much changing, it, 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 it can get quite, um, quite frustrating. Um, it's, you know, I, I filled in questionnaires, I did focus groups, and it was, just, it was incredibly repetitive. And, and the other thing being that it uh, very rarely utilized the, the range of skills. My, my, my skills were, uh, were starting to come back. As I was kind of re re recovering and managing to deal with the alcohol side of things, I was developing more clarity, and so a sense of my own uh, worth was was starting to return, and a lot of that uh, activity around ticking boxes just wasn't wasn't utilizing. It felt really frustrating, and I felt like I wanted to ask people around the table who were all being paid, and I wasn't. You know, what is it about your time that makes it v valued in that way, whereas mine is not valued in any way. Can you answer the question as to why your time is valued in a different way to mine? And of course, I know what the answers are. We don't have a budget for this, whatever. But actually, there is no real reason why uh, what people like myself bring shouldn't be, be valued equally. If that's what we say we're doing, um, then that's really what we ought to be doing. I've been parachuted in very often, um, being a patient story. I mean, there's fantastic work done about uh, around patient stories. Don't get me wrong, it really is essential. Not just patient stories, but staff stories as well. All our stories really, really important. But it, they, they, there was a sense of uh, it just being part of the entertainment, you know, at the beginning of a meeting, after which having been drained and re-traumatized yet again telling my story, which I suppose I'm doing now, but hopefully in a different way, uh, you know, that, that, that I was then going to be, uh, you know, patted on the head and given a biscuit and a cup of tea, and then uh, the, the professionals would get, get on and do the, the job of the professionals. And that was becoming increasingly frustrating for me. Um, uh, so I would add to my list of diagnostic labels, I think I've got about four of them. Uh, I would add consultation fatigue, really. Um, they were very, it, was, it was very repetitive. You'd often get uh, different bits of the organization doing a focus group on exactly the same thing. And I'd see the same people there. And we'd repeat the same thing. And we were kind of cleaning up on Tesco vouchers, a lot of us, which was very, very helpful, but really kind of a bit wasteful. 
So, uh, and the thing is about this is it's really insane uh, because, you know, that's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Um, the overall effect on me was, of course, uh, <laughs> I was getting angry because I had uh, no way of constructively challenging, channeling the, the, my, uh, my, my feelings about the, the, some, of the, some of the experiences I'd had, in, especially where it's actively harmed me. Um, what I really wanted to do was see some, uh, some change happen as a result of, 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 of that, but I had uh, no real ability to, 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 to be constructive with that. I didn't know how to, and it would just take, it would just take uh, some interaction around a table, a, a meeting, to start reflecting some of the more toxic interactions with healthcare professionals. Uh, for it all just to trigger off the whole red mist territory thing, um, causing the professionals to retreat into defensive, uh, you know, rightly so, because I would too, uh, because this is really what I think I was like, with the, uh, the axe here. Um, and, uh, you know, this is what happens when engagement is not thought through and is, 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 added on to what's happening already and, uh, and doesn't actually lead to any change, then the people who are drafted in, parachuted in to, to, to get involved, either become part of all that, which also happens with some of the more entrenched sort of uh, patient reps and so on, or we, or we just get angry and we just end up sitting ranting about, about car parks and food and stuff. It's just, you know, and, and there's no... Um, Nothing constructive comes out of it, and there's no relationships formed. There's no dialogue. It's 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 about combat, and and it's about uh, you know it's 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 just it's just not it's not helpful uh, for anyone. It's not helpful for anyone. I knew I wanted revolution, uh, but I'm afraid to say it was more of a, the um, Napoleonic variety. Uh, so. Uh, this was uh, what I, how I thought it would, would happen. And, you know, I wanted instant results. Uh, and if it was by violent struggle, then all the better, really. So, I, I mean, I really am being honest about what it must have been like as a professional having to engage with me in a meeting uh, in this period. Uh, not, not pleasant. Um, another light bulb moment, because uh, I knew there was, something, <laughs> there was something around this engagement lark, but it just... Um, uh, there was something missing. Uh, I was getting so angry at this time that uh, at this time I was a governor. I was governor of a mental health trust, and I was getting so angry. I was actually having uh, one woman stands in the mental health unit to, on behalf of patients. I was refusing to to move and stuff until I got my own way. And I was telling them, look, I'm like a camel. I don't need to go to the toilet. I can stand here for days. So you just work it out. You know, you go and sort it. And I, you know, and this is, it was certainly producing results because they would just do what I wanted to, just to get rid of me, frankly speaking. Uh, and, um, you know, there are several people who say that, that, that they, they're the people they're carers for, that uh, I saved their life, whatever. But the impact on me was I, I, I ended up relapsing myself. So I'd be campaigning for patient X to get the proper treatment in my humble estimation. And then I would relapse myself, and I'd end up in hospital with that very same patient. So it was you know, completely toxic. Um, so while I, I ended up relapsing, and I relapsed on alcohol as well, so I um, finally ended up in uh, rehab uh, down in, in Plymouth, which really, really helped me. And there, um, I was catching up on some reading, and I was given uh, a book by um, an angry carer, who was the angry carer to my angry patient. Uh, he had read this book, um, No More Throwaway People, um, by Professor Edgar S. Cannon, and I would really uh, recommend that to everyone. Um, he uh, was a, a civil rights lawyer in the United States in the 60s, and he'd worked for Robert Kennedy, he was a speech writer for Robert Kennedy, and he did some amazing work with Native Americans around access to justice, and just a, a general, you know, fantastic hell-raising lawyer, a really great guy. And he had a, a massive heart attack at the age of 46, and he had that same, that same identity loss that I experience he he talks about and this is what he said in the book and this is like I could have said this 
um, this is Edgar these days. Um, he's still very, very active around, and um, I, I, I get this. I, I absolutely get his his, his uh, feelings around this. Um, and he sat in the hospital thinking about how um, he had all the care that he required. He was uh, being well looked after, but he wanted to be someone who contributed to society. Um, yeah, this is an article I wrote about about this um, for a housing organization. And this is the image they chose to uh, describe my experiences. So he, he Edgar uh, wanted to find a way that people labeled throw away. Uh, so by virtue of being the other. So that might be having a long-term health condition, being in the criminal justice system, having a disability through age, all a whole raft of stuff could actually contribute and have um, assets recognized and utilized, not necessarily using money. Um, and that would be uh, the way of enabling co-production that Eleanor Ostrom prior to, to, to him had defined, uh, a way of making that happen in practice. And he created the first uh, time banks, um, a form of exchange of, of, of assets of individuals and of organizations where uh, a person's time is valued in exactly the same way, irrespective of, work, of, of a job or job title, where they're at in the, in the hierarchy. So it's about real value. And the thing that had been missing from my really largely tokenistic interactions with the health and social care system, and I really grasped it right away, uh, but I wanted to see it in practice. So when I came out of rehab, I went and joined... Um, uh, a time bank uh, day center in, in Camden in central London, mainly for homeless people, um, because I, I knew that Edgar Khan himself was an advisor there. So I went there and I did shifts as a support time recovery worker and I got paid. This was not like a, a service user engagement. I got paid, but I got paid in time bank credits. One hour of my time was worth one time bank credit and I was able to spend that. I could spend it on a whole range of stuff that was available in that time bank, but I chose to spend it on accredited training, something that was actually going to give me uh, a, a key to, to a future, an active future. So it felt different. It felt different than the, all the kind of worthy volunteering I had done. This was not volunteering. It was somebody actually giving me something in my hand that showed that I was worth something, and I didn't believe it until that that started. So I actually feel I owe Edgar Kahn a huge debt of gratitude. There's a lot of material out there in co-production. You just need to look it up, look up New Economics Foundation. Um, and the elves here, I've got a team of, of, of IT elves in the room. Um, I'm sure they'll find a way of putting up the link to my article uh, from the edge, uh, co-production, radical roots, radical results. So there you go. I'll hand over to the elves for that. They're all panicking now. This is fun. Uh, <laughs> um, these are the, the, the core uh, principles, really. Um, it's about reciprocity, and now that I'm sober, I can say the word reciprocity. That's never used to be able to do that. Um, and it, so it's about look at your engagement, look at the patient service user citizen engagement you're doing now. Is it really a two-way street? And in what way is it a two-way street? You know, you just ask yourself that question. It's not necessarily about money. I'm not advocating that we get paid for each and every time we, we do some activity. Some of the best way I've been repaid for what I've done, it was not in money at all. It was, um, I did a fellowship of uh, an organization you'll be hearing for, from Rachel about later. Um, and that opportunity to learn and develop and actually get myself a career, which has now happened, that was a, a fantastic way of, of, of repaying my efforts. So it's not tokenistic and it is, a two-way thing. This is um, what Edgar said here about the core economy, which is just that that exists in the community, where the, the, these, these bonds that we have where people automatically help each other out. Uh, without that happening, without having a, a you know, really assets-based community development approach, I don't think there's much point in going for co-production purely from a, a service point of view. There need, it needs to be built on something. Empowerment for people like myself who've been long-term throwaways does not just happen by, by accident. Uh, there needs to be, you know, a lot of uh, 
a lot of work done for, for a lot of us to actually reconnect with any any skills that, that we, we may have had. It's, it's not enough just to say, right now we're doing co-production and, and you're going to co-produce, because you could have asked me some of that stuff earlier on and I just wouldn't have had a clue. I was lucky enough um, to find my way to training. Um, there, there's not much training out there for people who, like myself, who are not, who are say but patient service users, um, patient reps, whatever, they're, 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 but there was some fantastic training available that I found in, in my area. Um, and it was run by, uh, actually Rachel was speaking later with my mentor on, on the, this training, um, and the other uh, two facilitators both had uh, experience of uh, life-changing health condition. Um, so it was another turning point for me that enabled me really to move on from the patient voice stuff to patient leadership because a lot of the barriers to me doing that weren't in the system. A lot of the barriers to me doing that were internal ones. They were the fact that they were due to feeling that genuinely I did not have the right to be sitting around the table with the people with the, with the job badges on. And that is something that I needed to do a lot of work around. Now, I'm a person that was making recommendations on a budget of 28 million and I was reduced to being someone who couldn't make decisions between bottles of shampoo in a shop. Uh, so, you know, if that can happen to me, then it, 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 it is an issue. So it's worth considering in investing in uh, training and development if you really want to have the kind of um, equal relationship with your st patient stroke service users, blobs, then it's, 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 worth, it's worth looking at. Um, patient as leaders is quite... Uh, it's quite a controversial term. Not everyone's happy with it. I think it depends on what you mean by leadership. This is my uh, thought on what leadership is about, rather than it being about position. So I don't see any reason why that shouldn't um, uh, refer to people who are not necessarily uh, in the hierarchy as well, but who are who are working working towards change in our in our healthcare system. Um, so we're more than experts by experience. For, for sure. I mean, the expertise, the, the lived experience is, is, is essential and adds that that um, unique factor that, that only someone who's been through that stuff can, can know about. But it's not all about that. So I think the term expert by experience is a little limiting. Uh, there's, uh, so I did this rather Dullsville um, uh, diagram, with, but, but uh, basically, to the, this is the theory according to me. Uh, the training development, the, the, the asset building, etc., on one side, and lived experience on the other, and the leadership bit being that bit in the, in the middle. And I don't know how I managed to do that, but I did anyway. And I managed to get some Monty Python in there. So, yeah, patient as leader, I see it as an inside job. Um, in order to, you know, put the axe down, I needed to be able to put the axe down, and that can be really difficult because a lot of us are good and angry about our experiences. You know, a lot of us have experienced harm, and it can be really, really difficult because we're not just talking about a job; we're talking about life experiences. So, the Centre for Patient Leadership; these were the guys that did that training course, uh, defined the patient leader as such, as the, as this. Sorry, my English is is um, deteriorating. Uh, now, if you look at the various, there's loads of them, aren't there? God, it looks like they're bringing out another one every week full of new buzzwords. But they all say this stuff, you know. This is a slightly out of date one now, Leadership Qualities Framework. It's all about self-belief, self aware It's about self-leadership for us, self-leadership, whether you're a paid person or not. Uh, there, there is no reason why we should not aspire to having these qualities in the work that we do. The current one, this is the NHS leadership model, uh, and this is, again, this is the same thing. That it is not about position. We know in reality when they're talking about leader, they, they are talking about the, let's face it, the managers. But they, you know, according to the models to which they claim to be operating, this is, what they, they, this is how they're viewing it, leadership. And it will take time to filter through, I think, but uh, this, is, this is what I believe in. And, and hopefully it applies to me as well. I needed to prove this, and I needed to kind of prove it to myself more than anything else, um, in that, you know, I, I still uh, have massive imposteritis, and I still feel like, I, you know, I want to be in the pa patient box a lot of the time, because it's a lot less scary. 
But due to a Twitter rant, I, I do, people who know me on Twitter, I do like my Twitter ranting. I ranted at the NHS Leadership Academy, and that just serves me right, because they actually called my bluff. And I pointed out that their lovely, lovely, lovely uh, leadership programs were not, avail were not open to everybody. Although, and and I, uh, so I, they said, oh, all right, then, uh, go, do, do it. Uh, we'll give you a place. So I, I did this. I did the Mary Seacole program, and it was absolutely hellishly difficult because <laughs> I didn't believe I had anything to, to really contribute. I hadn't written anything for a long time. But it was so valuable. It was such a valuable experience because I learned about the realities of what healthcare professionals are facing. These were mainly, I don't like the word frontline, but I can't be bothered thinking of another one frontline yet. Um, it's not the top of the tree people, it's the workers we're talking about. So rightly speaking, I should be amongst them. Uh, and they were amazing. There were nurses, there were all sorts of people. Um, and we all worked and learned together. And first of all, I could sense the level of fear among them. I, is this, is what we say here going to go any further? Uh, you know, and the pressures, the pressures of uh, the, the job and having to do this course as well on top of everything else. I, I realized that actually I, I, I was in a better position than them. I, I had more freedom to speak out and had more freedom to say what I thought. I didn't have to re report to anyone, uh, you know, to justify my being on this course, and I was damn well going to pass it if it was the last thing I did, because I did, <laughs> and it, you know, and I did. I, I managed to get a, a qualification in healthcare leadership, and I modified my approach. I modified my approach because it was all about expecting uh, professionals to walk in my shoes. And I still think that's a really good exercise to do. But one, one thing I was failing to do was consider walking in the shoes of professionals. And then discovering how many of the, the fears and the uh, resistance and everything else was a shared experience, that I felt it as well. Uh, and, and having a space that was safe enough for all of us to start exploring that stuff is really, really important. I really hope that I will be wedging the door of places like this open for others to, it's not just about me, I want this to be the norm, not the exception, because the people who were in study groups with me said it was the most powerful thing to actually be learning and developing with people labeled patient for whatever reason as equals. This, these, these things do not usually happen. There's a lot of training goes on. There's masses for, for professionals. Uh, but it happens in silos. Like everything else, it happens in silos. And uh, you know, we need to be doing concentrating, I think, on developing shared spaces so that we can come up with shared solutions to these problems. I'm ranting. So time for some, uh, some literature, I think, yeah. What, what gets in the way is, of course, fear, uh, the F factor. I've had a lot of resistance to my ideas from the so-called patient side as well, uh, and uh, you know, from people from, uh, who are quite uh, happy in the uh, traditional patient and public involvement roles. Um, and because it's about change, it's about it's about blurring boundaries, and the boundaries are there. The boundaries are there to keep us, to keep us safe a lot of the time, you know. And 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 so therefore, anything that's blurring that is going to start feeling a little bit edgy, I should say. And when uh, when you have bunkers, when you have defensive bunkers uh, that you need to retreat into because it's just getting too scary, they become silos. And these these are the silos here. And, and, you know, then it's the use of language. I've done it myself. I'm a former um, pub public servant, and I did this. I know each and everything I accuse uh, of professionals of doing, I can assure you, I have done in spades myself. I would have found someone like me profoundly challenging in my old role where I felt I was only just keeping the plates spinning. So, you know, I get it because I've been there. Nowadays, thanks to all these opportunities, the, the work I've done with, with Clark, I should say, I also did a fellowship with Clark, which hopefully Rachel will mention in a bit. Um, and this just, uh, walking more in professional shoes and understanding the, the realities uh, of the situation has given me the belief now that it's not so much about bombing the silos, you know, it, spectacularly, as much as I really quite enjoy some of that stuff. Um, I'm a bit of a, I do like chaining myself to railings for causes still. 
Uh, it's probably going to be more likely to result in change if it's gradual and it's about planting seeds. It's about planting seeds rather than Semtex. It's about different kind of relationships, different conversations. Uh, this, I've even got Gandhi in this. I thought, God, how annoying is that? Anyway, um, he talked about revolution as well, but not, as, not about seizing power, but about transformation of relationships. And I think this is the key. It's about sharing in, 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 in solutions. Uh, it's about proper use of assets uh, and, and, uh, and dialogue, and, and about genuine, authentic dialogue in a space that is safe enough to do so. It's not about uh, tra handing over power. It's not about already powerless professionals feeling they've got to be drained yet more of power. It is about, um, it's about strengthening the power base. It's about strengthening the power base together so that there's more of it to go around. It's like admitting that we don't have the whole picture, I don't have the whole picture, I've got important bits of it, we all have important bits of it, and if we bring all that together, we've got a chance of getting somewhere. That's enough about me, I reckon. Um, let me see now, what's my next thingy? Yeah. I think it's about time that I actually involve somebody else, otherwise I might get the idea it's all about me. Um, I want to perhaps bring in a couple of uh, colleagues who have, have had the misfortune of working with me over quite an extended period. And so we've all learned quite a lot, I think, good and bad, uh, as we've, we've gone through the, the whole process together. So I thought it would be a good idea to bring them in. And if the IT works, they should be around to join us. So I have two colleagues here. Uh, I was going to go to Rachel first, actually, I was gonna, and I have warned her about this. <laughs> This is this is Rachel. Um, Rachel, would you like? Hello, Rachel. Are you there? I am here. Yes. Can you hear me? All right. Yes. Ground control to Major Rachel. Brilliant. <laughs> um, welcome. Thank you so much for for coming along. Um, I just, as I said, I uh, I think I don't know who we have uh, joining us today. There may be people from overseas who don't who may not even have heard of Clark. Can you imagine? So I wondered if you might just uh, introduce yourself a bit and just uh, do that. The, the one of those elevator pitches that you've you've been forcing me to do with Clark for for some time now. If you just like to tell us a bit about your work and what, what, how you actually work collaboratively with, with patients. Yeah, sure. Thank, thank you very much, Alison, and, and thank you for inviting me to join you on the conversation today. And, and just to um, say what a great presentation. There's so many themes that you and I have talked about over quite a long period of time now, and it's just really important to see them um, sort of consolidated. Um, just very briefly for, um, for people who may not be aware of Clark, I'll just uh, let you know what the acronym is. Uh, and then what we do and what my role is within that program. So um, the NHR class is the National, Insti National Institute for Health Research and it's a collaboration for leadership and applied health research and care and we're based in northwest London and we're currently one of 13 clerks. There are three in London and the rest are based in England. Um, and the purpose of clerks really is to essentially speed up the application of research evidence uh, into practice so that um, it ultimately it will benefit patients, improve health outcomes and patient experience. And each of the clerks probably works in a slightly different way um, and the purpose of our clerk really is we focus on improvement um, and the methods that we can use for improvement and how importantly how patients, carers and families have a critical role to play in that. So that's very, very quickly what Clark is about. Um, and my role is to lead on the way we involve patients and the public. Um, and as Alison has um, talked about in her, um, in her presentation, um, we've had a bit of a sort of uh, learning epiphany along the way, really, in terms of how we might do that. Um, so my role is essentially to um, support the improvement teams to involve patients and families and carers. We also research how involvement takes place in these teams. And importantly, I think we begin to look for new ways of how we can do this. Um, and I think um, a lot of the way we've changed our thinking has been um, strongly influenced by Alison and a lot of the themes that we've talked about uh, together and, and which she's incorporated into her presentation. Um, so I think Alison also asked me to reflect on some of the key learning maybe that we've had together. Is that, is that right? Would you like me to move on well, to that? Well, we can go on to that now if you like. Yeah, yep, yep, that's okay. So I think um, listening to the, the themes um, 
that Alison's talked about. I mean, I was just jotting down a few things as she was talking. I think in terms of how we work together, I think what Alison's demonstrated, and it probably applies to all of us, is um, there's a huge element of courage required in this work, um, the courage to confront um, ourselves as much as anything. And I think uh, that's something that's uh, been a really important learning po point for me because a lot of the learning that Alison talked about, particularly around the fellowship and the NHS Leadership Academy, I was doing my own personal development at the time and I realised probably what we were going through was quite similar. So it was sort of, we both had to reflect on how we'd done things or been or where we'd been in the past. And, and, and maybe there were some similarities, but from very different perspectives. Mm -hmm. So I think courage is a, a really important theme. I think honesty is another theme that comes through. Um, and I think to do involvement and engagement well, um, you do have to have a level of honesty that... Um, in order to develop a, an effective dialogue. And if you don't develop a dialogue, um, I would suggest that involvement is probably going to get stuck in a very sort of, um, very, very sort of basic step. Um, so those are two themes, I think. And the other one, of course, is relationships. And I think Becky may go on to talk a little bit about this as well. So in terms of um, practically working together, I think um, the learning that Alison and I have been on together is what Alison has essentially taught me is when you think you understand, you may need to check again. And my background is nursing. I thought I understood people, and I thought I could work out people fairly, fairly uh, not easily, but I thought I, I could sort of understand it. But I think what Alison's story uh, made me realise was I was only even just touching the surface, and it takes a lot of, um, I suppose, really questioning how empathetic you are and how um, you really need to begin to get underneath the skin. So the quote that Alison brought in from um, To Kill a Mockingbird, Atticus Finch, is a really important one. And that is not something that can be done just once. You have to keep going back to it. You have to keep getting under the skin. So that really brings me to my next sort of um, learning point, which is uh, how to persist in the face of difficulty. Um, and Alison, again, has been very honest about um, how she might have behaved with professionals over time and I think she and I have probably experienced that together and I think on both parts we might have both wanted to run away yes um for different reasons um but I think for whatever reason we managed to not run away and I think everything has become stronger because of that and I still think we will encounter points where we might still want to run away <laughs> but we've learned to sort of recognize that running away is probably a sign that something is happening Yes. So that is also something that I think we've learned together is that if it's feeling really uncomfortable, there's probably a reason for it. It's because we're learning to go, hang on a minute, this just isn't working. What's going on here? And I think that's an important lesson. It's not just applicable really for engagement involvement. Around a lot, It's around, for me, a lot of work with teams generally is um, how do you move people out of the comfort zone into the discomfort area but not into the panic area. So it's how, do we, how do we sort of get that balance? And I was really conscious, um, just listening uh, right from the beginning, about this is an edge talk. And I was reflecting that I'm very firmly rooted in the system for lots of different reasons, but I have to have one eye on the edge. And I think that's the balance that um, is quite difficult. And I think this, if people are interested around elements of system leadership, then I think this is um, the area that, that I think is quite interesting, is how do you work with people who essentially appear to be mavericks, but actually are offering some different insight that could really be valuable to all of us. And so my final point, and then I'm sure Becky will want to come in on some things and Alison may want to respond, I think it's the separation between our intellectual understanding of ideas, which is something, again, Alison said to me in a meeting, which absolutely captured the difficulties that we sometimes encounter that, and these are really her words, but I, I still, I suppose, use them myself quite a lot now, is intellectually we can often rationalize things and we understand facts and figures and what's going on but emotionally we may be lagging behind or we're not matching our rationalization and that's where a lot of our discomfort comes from and it's having the confidence to recognize that that's happening um, and then managing both of those elements and I think I, I, since Alison sort of pointed that out to me I notice that a lot more now with people and I feel I personally feel more confident to, to understand that where people may be responding from an emotional perspective, uh, even though they can intellectually get that. So I think there's there's a, there's a lot um, in in the ba there's a lot of balancing acts happening here. I think. 
Um, so I think I, I, if I leave it there for now, and then Do Alison, do you want to respond, or if you want to bring in Becky? Yeah, I, I, first of all, I should. Uh, I was remiss of me to say, to advise everyone that's joining us online that there'll be an opportunity actually for people to to, to put questions. Um, I'm not sure how that happens. Maybe hand. Uh, uh, how does you can put questions if you want to ask either myself or Rachel and after hearing Becky. Uh, you can do it by, uh, apparently I know nothing of what I'm saying, so just like I hope it means something to someone. They put it in the chat room or you can phone in apparently. This is, oh, they're, they're making, they're doing semaphore at me across the table. No, no, you've got to go slowly for granny. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> um, you, if you um, put your hand upon the, on your phone, um, there's an icon that you can able to put your hand up. You can... Um, we can unmute you, and you can ask a question in the in the to Alison in the panel. That's exciting. That's really good. Uh, actually, Rachel, you said everything there. That was really amazing. I I I know now, with the benefit of hindsight, that those um, to to quote one of the the, um, the the Clark articles, those rupture points where we've have actually been in a really very uncomfortable space where there's been a kind of uh, clashing of, of assumptions and all sorts sort of things, uh, that th those have actually been where we've made the most progress because it's what we've actually done with those. And I think having the Clark uh, methodology of looking at that and then and then uh, trying again and to see how we can do things differently, it, it, it really, really helps. So, you know, if you uh, if you are having that, that kind of experience, it probably means you, 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 you're getting there. Um, because if it if it isn't if it isn't causing discomfort, then it probably isn't it probably isn't quite getting there. So I think you made some really important points. So if you wouldn't mind staying online, just in case anyone else um, mm -hmm. wants to to come in and uh, make any points or ask any questions. But for the time being, thank you very much. Now hopefully Becky should be in another office in another part of town somewhere. Are you there, Becky? I'm here. Can you, Can you hear me? me? Yeah, oh, there you Can are. You Hello hear me? there. Hello. So we have Great. Seat. There we have uh, the, the lovely Becky from the King's Fund has just joined us, and uh, just as Rachel's done, I wonder if you wouldn't mind just um, telling us a bit about, um, about yourself and the work that, you, that I know you're doing, because I'm an associate at the King's Fund now as well. Um, so um, it really over to you, and uh, then we can hopefully have a bit of a, of a discussion um, after you've finished. That would be great. Fantastic. Thank you, Alison. Um, so uh, my name is Becky Seal and I'm a consultant in leadership development at the King's Fund. Um, for those of you that don't know the King's Fund, we're an independent charity and we work to improve health and healthcare in England. Um, and we do that through research and analysis, um, developing individuals and teams and organisations and uh, promoting understanding of the health and social care system. Um, so I've been working with Alison for, I think, I haven't sorted this off, but definitely well over a year. Um, and we've been particularly thinking about how we all work together to support this paradigm shift in the system. So we, we kind of know now, I think a lot of us know what we should be doing. Um, so we want a move from patients as passive recipients of services to, to a role where they're much more instrumental in the design and delivery and leadership of, of the healthcare system. But I think what we've really focused in on is, is that we might not know how to do that. Um, and so our offer at the King's Fund really is, is, at the moment, is really looking into that, how we help patients and professionals together to build the skills and relationships that they need for partnership. And we're really thinking about this in terms of partnership. So, so I suppose in terms of this, this talk, um, we're thinking that it's not about patients on their own driving change, but us all driving change together. Um, so how can we learn how can we learn to do that together, really? So that's the kind of summary of the work that we're doing. Um, in terms of uh, the, what we've learned as we've been um, trying to support this change and, and develop partnership, um, it comes from working with Alison and others. Like, you know, we've been actually trying to role model this partnership approach in all of the work that we do. It's one of the principles that we established right from the beginning is that if we at the King's Fund are doing any work with organizations or out in the system about patient leadership and working with partners, then we have to do it in partnership um, with a patient leader. And that's been really important. Um, 
We've also run roundtables, um, and as we've been working out in the system, I've kind of picked up on some observations. So, three learnings. Um, I think number one, I won't um, I won't go over this too much because I think it just it just echoes what Alison has already said about um, issues of power, control, and identity. So I suppose from a leadership development perspective, my my learning is that you just can't underestimate the primal instincts that are, that are at play when we're attempting partnership working with patients. And I think that's probably true of any partnership uh, working, but it seems to be particularly prevalent here um, when clinicians and patients are working together. Um, and that might materialize as, as, a, as resistance and it might be quite kind of um, innocuous seeming resistance like uh, just you know we can't have patients come into the room because you know they won't like the way that we work or you know we might have to change the way that we work um, and that might seem just innocuous uh, and sometimes I, I talk about it I've said to Alison before the, the smiling brick wall that you get um, but if we actually dig underneath what's going on there, I think at heart it's, it challenges people's very identity. Um, if patients are there at the board table as a board member, what does that mean about me as a board member? What does that mean about what it is to be a board member? Or if I'm, if I'm sharing um, decisions with a patient and I'm a clinician, what does that mean about me and my role? I've always been taught about what it is to be a clinician. So I guess as, as picking up on what Rachel said as well, it's that it's, it's those personal things, it's the internal barriers um, that we could do with paying attention to and just being really honest about how this, how this challenges us. Um, so the second one, the second bit of learning is um, that there is hope really, I think, in, in learning and ability to shift roles. So we do have multiple roles, we all have multiple roles and um, we actually in daily life move through them pretty fluidly. Uh, so, you know, I'm, I'm a, a daughter and a sister when I'm with my family, I'm a, I'm a partner when I'm at home, I'm a leadership development consultant at work, um, I'm a patient if I'm in the GP surgery, for example, and also there is overlap between those roles and we are able to consciously choose which one we take up. So sometimes I might be in a hospital or in a GP surgery, not as a patient, but as a leadership development consultant. And for me, that's quite easy because I can just go in and say, I work at the King's Fund and, and people can see that shift in my role and, and accept it. But what does it mean for a patient um, going into a meeting room with uh, a load of clinicians who uh, and having the joint task of, of service development? I think what we've been uh, learning as we've been working with organizations is that it might require, um, if we're thinking about kind of roles as hats, that it might require patients to take off their patient hat for a bit or the doctor to take off their patient hat, uh, their doctor hat for a bit, or actually perhaps more accurately to put on another hat over the top. So to keep that, to keep that identity and that difference. Um, but to recognize that you're, you at that moment are in that room to work together to develop a service and in that there is, you know, there is a certain amount of equality. And that brings me on to my third point which is about sameness and difference. And this is a really tricky one and I think it's come up for um, Alison and I in the work that we've done and I certainly still you know, we're still working on it, I find it really hard. So it's this idea of working in partnership um, that it doesn't mean we're all the same. So um, the reason that we actually want patients and health professionals to work together is because they're different. So why is it that suddenly when we when we are in this space together that we start whitewashing and saying, well, we're all patients and, uh, you know, Alison and I, sometimes I've said to her, well, we're, you know, you're a colleague, you're, now you, you're, you're an associate at the King's Fund, we're both colleagues. But I guess what I've learned is that um, to do that, it, it, uh, it sort of, you lose the beauty of our differences and also you can potentially neglect the support that might need to be in place for, for all of us who are involved. Um, so I'm sure there's been times when I've um, patronised Alison terribly by over-supporting her <laughs> and, um, and also times when I've under-supported and I think there's also been times where Alison's underestimated the support that I need and I think what we've learnt really is that it's so easy to make assumptions um, 
and that we will make mistakes and and the key thing is that we're big enough to apologize and talk about what happened and learn each time more about what we both need um, and I think I'll end there by just summarizing to say that I think as with Rachel um, that understanding each other and being willing to change ourselves is the first step to being able to collectively drive change in the system. Thank you very much, Becky. That was, as I knew it would be, really very honest, and it, it's actually made uh, some things come up uh, for me. Um, I, I've actually found the transition into being a professional now, particularly after you know, it was 17 years since I uh, last worked in a kind of organisational sense. I found it really quite challenging, and I, I I've had sort of endless debates with myself and others uh, about whether that means I'm not, am I a professional patient, uh, am I even still a patient, or you know, what in fact am I and which box am I in, and there's still this need, I think, to, to, to be in a box of, of some kind. And I, I um, was at a conference where, you know, I, I now have this role with um, NHSIQ, which is a fantastic example of an organization taking those risks as well. Um, and I, but I wasn't able to, to be part of the team's work on the stand that they had at this uh, exhibition. And I also wasn't in, on the patient panel. And I felt extremely uncomfortable. And I thought, I have no idea which I am. And I was in this kind of no person's land between you know not a fully in the professional team and not with a patient team and I, although it was extremely uncomfortable re reflecting on it all afterwards which is what, how i try and work you know how painful it is to try and see what what is this trying to tell me and realizing that in fact that's exactly where i needed to be um because uh, and i think you you said this um it's not rigid it's not there's times when it's more about my personal experience and it's about my story and it's about that stuff and I never want to lose that you know I think that, that I've heard that Trish, Trish Greenhouse calls it going native I'm not sure I like that expression but I know what it means I don't want to lose the uniqueness of uh, the insight that I've had the, the from direct experience of that stuff I never want to lose that patient bit of it um, but it's not always the right thing to be to be dwelling on, in, depending on the bit of work that I have in front of me. I think with Clark, I sit on a governance committee with that uh, with Clark, and I, I had the, also uh, that same revelation there. I thought, well, wait a minute, I'm not actually here because of my lived experience uh, f at this moment. The skills I'm utilizing are more about the career I had before I became ill, where I, I was required to be able to influence and uh, work effectively in, in that kind of setting. So part of, I think, the, the, the leadership and the, and the training that I've had was um, uh, kind of uh, giving me some tools so that I know when to use which and when to leave the personal stuff at the door when to use it, when to use it, as uh, David Gilbert says, judiciously. So, in, and he's always said something about it's not about leaving the baggage behind. It's it's about learning to park it, pack it more smartly, or something. If I've misquoted David Gilbert, he will definitely give me a hard time. But it's roughly that. So, you know, it, that that's uh, and it, and I and I can get it wrong. I can get it wrong if I. Um, as the interaction starts reflect, uh, when I was doing some King's Fund work, I was training a group of uh, uh, consultants, uh, and one <laughs> psychiatrist there uh, was was feeling quite uh, defensive. Uh, was uh, I could see this from the body language, and then negated my experiences, and and because it reflected what I'd been through with a lot of psychiatrists the dynamics changed and it became quite quite un, unhelpful <laughs> because it, suddenly I, I'm no longer a professional in a room doing a job of work but I'm back there in the consultation uh, uh, room and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get through to, to a doctor who's got all the power and I'm not doing it so how am I reacting I'm, I'm like a, I've gone into the child and I've, mm -hmm. I'm having a tantrum basically um, so these things do do happen, but as as I as I, I I 
continue to develop with the, with the help of people like yourself and Rachel. Um, you know, the, these are becoming becoming rarer, but it, it is quite difficult. It is quite difficult to 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 know um, to know how to, to how to do that and how to to judge which is which. But yes, both of you, I think that was absolutely great. Now, I think now we can hand over to cyberspace. Is that what can now happen? Well, the elves are looking all excited now. I've got um, a question in the chat box that's um, directed to Becky. Um, hopefully, um, I can read it out. Um, so this is a question: What is the role do you think patient participation groups has to support um, ongoing discussions between practice and patient collaboration in co-production of healthcare? So, so are we? Mm. Are we, t are we talking um, like in GP surgeries, the patient I, I groups think there? Possibly, let me just have a look. It's a general question that's in the chat box. So, okay. So, um, I think if we just general and maybe if we want to take from um, um, GP side and then maybe acute side, maybe take it as two separate, then it'd be great for everybody to look at that okay. a little bit wider. Or is it more about the actual patient group, about being about pa mm. uh, patient uh, participation groups, the role of? Uh, that's, that's what I would take from it. I don't. Okay. I'll just talk. I'll talk about any patient, any <laughs> any patients working in the system. What's their role? Go on. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think Alison would answer this better than me, but I think, you know, I've learned so much um, from Alison and Mark Doughty in particular at Centre of Patient Leadership about the kind of importance of role modelling, um, the sorts of behaviours that, that we want to see. And so I think it's exactly what Alison was talking about, about that self-leadership. So, um, you know, moving away from those um, them and us conflicts that can happen um, demonstrating that actually we can work together and I think people if you model that behavior and you do it consistently I think you'll see a tipping point I think um, it won't be possible for people to to fight and people will be quite surprised I think because there's a there's um, an image in people's head about this kind of shouty patient um, so I think if we move beyond that and work as partners then hopefully people will will take us up on the offer and w work with us in the same way. I don't know if I'm being horrendously naive, but that's the sort of principle that I'm uh, that we're all trying to work with. Yeah. And I, I think it's less about the actual specific of the of the role. So it might be a, a, a patient participation group. It, it might be being a lay member on a CCG. It might be there's a whole raft of ways in which patients in uh, are, are operating. And I think the the the, the principles of um, that, like Becky's just said about self leadership, about collaboration, about dialogue, about knowing how to ask questions is really mm -hmm. really vital in whatever setting that may be in a GP setting, in primary care, in acute care. It, 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 the 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 same principles. I'm going to talk just after this. I'm going to give uh, some specific examples of the kind of the the whole range of uh, roles that we're to be found in. There's no one size fits all um, and I think what 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 does unite the, or, or underpin the, the whole range of, of activities going on is it's effective if it's based on 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 uh, on, on dialogue definitely on dialogue mm -hmm. and genuine collaboration and on trust irrespective of where that works actually uh, happening I, I don't know if that's helpful um, we can just about, um, just, Val's just found the person that's asked the question, um, so he's going to join us. Um, so, oh. um, if you'd it's like to, welcome. Hello. So if you'd like to introduce yourself and say where you're from, and then um, ask the question to the panel, it'd be fantastic. Thank you. Hey, thanks very much, Ali. It's Amir Hanan here. I'm a GP Hi, at Horton Thorny. Orson Thorny Medical Centres, um, and it was me asking the question because we've had our patient participation group now for 10 years, um, and Ingrid, if you're listening in, it'd be great to have you on the call because I'm actually going to pass this over to Ingrid. Um, Ingrid, Ingrid Brindle's the chair of our PPG, um, and we've been running now for 10 years, and it's been very much an opportunity for us to hear the voice of patients um, as a as a group, um, but actually, what I want to do is pass this over to to Ingrid to ask her what um, her thoughts are about the role of the PPG in relation to this, not just for inside the practice, but also wider in terms of 
um, engagement with the CCG and maybe some of the things that she's been doing as a patient. Hey, Ingrid, are you, are you there? I don't know if Ingrid's... Is, any, is anyone... Hi, um, is Ingrid on a different phone? For a question, Amir, so I'm just conscious of time. Yes, I was, I was um, passing over to... If, if we can get hold of Ingrid, someone can contact her, but I'll, I'll speak... I'll keep going if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just some the, just the, to clarify the question, really, so that we can answer it would be great. Fantastic. Yeah, the, the question was that you've got patient-patient leadership, but you've also got the a patient participation group that's um, got the collective... What we found is patients have their own personal experience, but they often learn off each other, mm -hmm. and they're able to articulate um, an understanding which is re has been really helpful for us as a practice, but it's also been incredibly helpful for um, learning about how the system works and the gaps that they're finding, which uh, can then feed back up to the CCG. Yeah. My, I would say, uh, given my, well, how I define uh, leadership, the fact that they're able to articulate and work in that way, and I know it's extremely effective uh, in, in your practice, what you're doing is incredible. Um, I would suggest, given what, how you've just described the way they work, that they are patient leaders. They may not choose to define themselves as such, but because they're effective in articulating uh, their, their concerns, they're working with you clearly in, in equal partnership, um, they're, they're, not, uh, they're, they're not coming in and having a rant, they're working with you constructively. That is leadership. Um, so it's less about the actual forum in which it's happening, it's more about the, the qualities of the individual and yes, uh, of the whole as well, that, 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 that as a group, you know, this is, this is the case in any working setting. Um, the, the, they will be learning from each other as well. The ability to do that is another as aspect of leadership. So I think it's, it's great that you've joined us today because this would be one of the examples I'd be giving of, of how to get it right in that, in that setting in, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the primary care level. So thank you very much for joining us, Amir. That, thank you. That's great to have your involvement today. Um, um, I think now would be, an, um, would Becky like to um, have any more comments or Rachel on this? And then I think I'm just giving our Twitter and chat room guys um, a countdown. We'll go over to them and see if there's any um, comments or questions that they'd like to put forward. But uh, just from um, Becky and Rachel, if there's any other comments now that um, you'd like to um, After the discussion, it's Rachel here. Just just a couple, couple of um, additional observations. I think going back to the, um, I think there's a couple of things that Alison had mentioned around co-production. And although in our clerk we are not what, doing what I would call what is proper co-production, we work very much to those principles now. And just in terms of the question about the patient participation groups, I mean one of the things I would um, encourage a, a group to think about is. Um, the assets again. So it's a word that not everybody likes, but as Alison pointed out in her presentation, it's not just the lived experience, it's the other things that people can bring. And I think we're just trying to work through uh, within our own exchange network, which is our new group that we sort of formed in the last about 18 months, and we're sort of testing it at the moment in terms of trying to enact reciprocity. So the idea of exchanges, it's always a two way street. So as part of that process, it's really getting to know what people can offer and also what are the tasks that you want to work on together because I think my sort of radar um, is always alert um, to tokenism mm -hmm. and if people cannot tell me why they want to involve people or what they're going to do with them then that's usually my sort of um, alarm bell for you're doing it because you have to and not because you need to or want to and you haven't really mm -hmm. thought through um, how people are going to work with you. So I would really go back to the principles of co-production to sort of help guide some of the work in the patient participation groups, and that probably applies to any group. Mm -hmm. And the other thing about um, the sort of the issue about, I think Becky mentioned it as well, about the sort of shifting and blurring of our own roles, is when we did some open space activity, and Alison will remember this, because um, it's really where co-production came right up to the top of the agenda for us. Um, we did open space technology, which for, pe for people who are not familiar with it, is where you essentially um, come together around a theme. You do not set the agenda. You allow the participants on the day to set that agenda, and people are free to come and go as they want. So it's a very, very... Um, alien way of working for people who are used to working within the system but actually what it does is 
um, you have no job titles, people really don't quite know who they're talking to, and it's a much more creative process. And I think for us in Clark, when we did that, it really demonstrated um, how things could shift, the power could shift around much more easily. And I have to say, when we first did that, I felt like I was jumping off the cliff to convince our RM um, director to have a go at doing that in, a, in essentially what is a very... Uh, quite a traditional system. So, so I, that's sort of two tips really: is go back to the principles of co-production, and have an experimentation at some stage if you can, with um, what I would call less formal techniques, which can unlock a much greater creativity than some of the traditional methods. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Rachel, and thank you for mentioning the Exchange Network, something that's been really close to my heart. And I remember that Open Space Day, and I remember <laughs> waving Time Bank credits that I happened to have in my handbag at everybody. But anyway, <laughs> yes. Um, I think we've got um, two people on the line. Uh, First of all, we've got um, Carol, um, and we're just unmuting you now. From the um, she's calling from the voluntary sector. So just to be clear, Carol, it's not our Carol who's about to report on Twitter. So <laughs> welcome to the session. Thank you. The one and only Carol Munt. Hi, oh, Alison. You, yeah, I think. Uh, we we uh, think from the same box sometimes. Um, one thing I, I'd like to add about patients and patient leadership or patient participation of any sort, and that is that it's absolutely no good for the health profession or CCGs or whoever to just simply say they want a patient on a group. If you get the wrong patient or a patient who really doesn't understand, for example, a recent situation was with... Um, a CCG who picked somebody to be on the primary care group and I happened to meet up with this, this person afterwards at, a, at another conference and she said, I just haven't got a clue what I'm supposed to be doing and nobody's giving me any help and nobody's actually uh, explaining how to go about it, etc, etc. So I think there's something to really think about there that you... There is an awful lot for patients to learn. There's, uh, to, I mean, I, I haven't got a clue about um, what's happening in maternity at the moment, for example. I don't really know what's happening in other areas of the health of, of the NHS. I do know what's happening in elderly care. I know what's happening with dementia, and I'm very conscious about other things in the health service, but. To expect somebody to come in from a patient participation group and suddenly understand at the same level as the health professionals they're, they're sat around the table with is totally unrealistic. And I think that's something that, you, uh, that, that really has to be taken on board. You can have somebody who's got the passion to want to do it, but without that toolbox, you're lost. Spot on, Carol. Thank you, thank Carol. You. Um, just getting really short of time. Thank you so much, Carol. And you know, you know, absolutely spot on. Now, um, I'm just asking Val if she can um, mute and unmute. So if you can mute Carol and unmute um, David. So welcome, David. Thank you for joining us. Um, you are now Thanks. unmuted. Yes. Thank you. Uh, David McNally from uh, NHS England. I work in our um, patient experience team. Uh, Hello, thanks David. to Alison and Rachel and Becky. That was very interesting. We, we all know each other from, uh, from working together on, on different aspects of this. Today, I, I want to ask um, Alison, I think, primarily, but we, we just ran a project recently that actually Carol was uh, involved in, where we were trying to uh, investigate where patient, uh, as patients as leaders had helped improve patient experience. And one of the really interesting things when we asked that question of NHS organisations, which that many of them told us they were doing work in that kind of way, if you like, at the top of Alison's ladder, um, so just go think back to that slide. Whereas actually what, what then came back quite often in reality was, was, was not that, was actually a, a form of involvement or a form of engagement. So there's a real lack of understanding, I think, out yeah. there in the system that that at that ladder and um, it seems to me one of the things that we would be really useful for us to think about how we might do is to better explain uh, what co-design and co-production really means in practice because I think that's the bit, it's, that, it's that, that way of doing things that has been talked about a lot um, and articulated so well this morning and that I think a lot of the NHS doesn't, just doesn't get really um, and in some ways it's that, it's, the focus on that is probably more helpful in some ways um, than um, they're talking 
per se about patients and leaders, but I'd just be interested in listening to you about how we might get that message across better. Just my second very brief question was just about, um, have, you, have we got your point, Alison, about the, the, what the, your involvement in the Leadership Academy, um, has, has, that, has that spread in the way that you were describing? Have more people had an opportunity to be involved in the way that you were? Number one question, you're, you're absolutely right. and uh, uh, It's actually uh, a lot of people are in that kind of middle uh, zone of, of patient influence, as, as you say. Uh, and and they, 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 it has been described by two professionals recently when they discovered that, in fact, there was further to go. It was quite a shock to them because they thought they'd really got it sussed. And they believed they were co-producing because it's become quite a buzzword. Um, and uh, they, they both used the word smug, which is what, you know, they used that. And they were completely different organizations. It was one of the graduates uh, who graduated uh, uh, last week um, who, on her placement, she said she thought she'd understood it. And then, uh, what, uh, and then also one of my colleagues, uh, fellow fellows in Clark, um, believed that, you know, she was pretty much there and then realizing, wait a minute, um, there is further, there is further to go. And how both came to that conclusion was actually working with people that I would describe as patient leaders who are able to, uh, to, to, to have those conversations and, and ask, the, and ask the, right, the right questions. So I don't think co-production and patient leadership are, are at all exclusive. I think that, that, that one, one is necessary for the other to happen because it's about values and ways of, uh, ways of working. Uh, and it's about not being afraid to have those, those difficult conversations. Um, so, you know, it is a, a, a question of working together and progressing along, you know, further up the ladder jointly, but you can only do that jointly. You can't just suddenly decide to impose co-production right away. I, I used to wonder, is it, is it better to, to start? I often see even like the, 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 the bottom bit, the more passive stuff about information given and everything else. That's all important as well. It's important to get that right, and it's almost the bedrock. You need to have that in place in order to, before you can start pushing to, to, the, to go further. I mean, there's lots and lots of material out there about where it's really happening with co-production. You know, they, they, they just, um, if, if you, you just need to, to, to have those conversations together and not try and work it out in, in silos. There is no easy answer. It's messy and it's, it, needs, it needs to be. If it's messy, it's probably working. And the Leadership Academy, um, well, I hope so. I, 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 will, I would uh, certainly hope that they, they, they will take this, this opportunity to develop shared leadership uh, training where we come together. You know, there's a lot of need for, for training and development separately because it's specific to role, but there, there is such power in doing that together where we're not just patient stories brought in at the beginning of a training uh, thing, but it's and, and a patient voice, a disembodied voice or whatever, that we're actually there learning each from each other's perspectives. It's not, it doesn't even seem to be rocket science to me. So here's hoping, and you know me, once I get an uh, idea in my mind, I'm pretty much determined to see something happen. If not with the Leadership Academy, then, then, then elsewhere. Great, thank you, um, David, um, for the question and joining us today. Um, now, we're running out of time very swiftly today. It's been an absolutely amazing session. Mm. Now we're just going to go straight over to Dom and get some um, comments from the chat room. And then um, we'll go to Carol for the Twitter feedback. So thank you so much. And I think what's come out of this session this morning is that, you know, there's still other, you know, maybe a session on co-production, and there's other things that we can grow from oh, this session today. Oh, we can do today. that, for sure. So, so over to Dom. Thank you. No problem. Hi, everybody. Um, I know we've run out of time. Thanks, Alison. Thanks for your time today. Um, the chat has been absolutely fantastic. Everybody's loving everything that you're saying and the fact that there's a bit of raw honesty. There's been a lot of people um, talking about their own personal lives as well and how it's affected them. Um, there's a couple of questions that haven't been answered as such yet, but um, Shibley had a question around um, the feeling is that genuine change is a process rather than an event. Um, is the outcome of co-production actually a product? Um, and I think whether we can answer that now or we do that in another session, which is specifically around co-production, might be the way forward. Um, and I just wanted to read something that uh, Christine mentioned as well when you were talking about your two-week loop in and out of hospital. Um, surely that must have signaled to professionals that you really needed um, help beyond the pat being patched up for the short term. Um, and if not, why are these signals not being dealt with compassion and holistically? So um, lots of other comments, but I know we're out of time. So 
I want to thank everybody for their, their feedback and maybe uh, we can answer some of these back in the email that goes out um, in the newsletter. Thank you, thank you, Dom. And you know, absolutely, we're just running out of chat. I think maybe this is something that we could also follow up with on um, Wednesday with the Twitter chat. So, Carol, are you ready? Hi, Carol. Carol, can you can you unmute Carol? We've lost Carol's phone. Yeah, it's all right. We're just trying to see if we can find trolls. To Major Carol. Hi, Carol. Can you hear us now? No, she's not there. <laughs> she's definitely dead. I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? I've now been unmuted Carol, successfully, go, I can Carol. see. Sorry. Can you hear me? <laughs> Thank you, Neil, Carol. <laughs> Neil Poir. Oh, man. Neil Poir. Right, let's have the, the feedback from um, your Twitter. Lovely to, lovely to see all the tweets go. Yeah, lovely feedback from everybody. Many people wanted to quote some text quote. They're writing all your quotes there. Ali, in their book. Hello. Hello. Hi, Carol. We're having a few problems with your phone. Hello. 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 Hi. Oh, right. I'm just difficult to be Carol's phone this morning. So I can hear you, and it looks like I'm unmuted. <laughs> oh, Carol, that's why. We've got the other Carol coming from the future. Right, OK. Um, I think we we'll perhaps have to give the feedback from Twitter, but I know from just keeping an eye on myself, it's been um, an amazing session on Twitter, and um, my favourite tweet of the, of the day was, um, I think it was somebody, James, who tweeted because he was listening from his hospital bed. So, oh. a special hi. Oh, um, magic. We hope you get well soon, and we are so thrilled to have you here. And, in and if session. it's not going well, tweet, tweet it. Get it out there. Tweet away, please. <laughs> uh, we hope you can join us in other sessions. So, yeah, great to be here today. I'm just going to hand over to Carol for um, to... Um, um, as on the her, her last talk. Uh, yes, last well, I think we're more or less done now, so because uh, it's all gone a bit pleasantly chaotic, I love it. Oh, right. <laughs> uh, right, okay. Basically, it's not about role. Get off. <laughs> One of the elves was biting me there. Um, it's not about uh, uh, about about role specifically. You'll find us in all these different. Uh, they're all descending into hysteria now. I don't know what this is going. So here's here's what we are. All sorts. Here are some good people to follow. There's some, you know, just to show the whole range of there's patient entrepreneurs here, uh, designing apps. There's uh, David Gilbert needs a special mention because he's the first patient director of an NHS trust working directly uh, with clinical and managerial directors as an equal in Sussex. So the way to go there. Um, fantastic work around self-management and education, where to be found. Uh, so it's not about role, it's about the qualities and the values and the way that we work. Take home messages. We're not all about needs. We all of us have different assets and we all of us have deficits. Don't be afraid to uh, turn the pyramid upside down. It might seem challenging, but it's often where the, the fortune lies. This is reverse innovation. It's those of us at the bottom of the pyramid may just have, if not the whole answer, a significant part of it. Please don't keep on capturing experiences. Let's liberate. Let's liberate all our experiences, whether we're staff, patients, blobs, squares. Liberate it as well as capturing it. And a bit of swearing. I was hoping we have some Americans on, on so that we can, we can be offensive. Uh, is London a bit of Banksy to, to finish off with? Don't let the boxes become petrified into bunkers because then they're a hell of a lot more dif difficult to get rid of. Thank you, comrades, for listening. It's, uh, it's been quite an experience, totally nerve-wracking. Please get in touch with me if there's anything that I've said that you want to follow up on. I'm really happy to answer anything. Find me on Twitter um, and uh, do keep in touch. This is a, all about conversation and I'm, I'm learning as much as everyone else. Thank you so much. Spasibo Valshoya. Thank you, Alison, and I'm sure all of you will be there agreeing with me. That was a brilliant session, really challenging, and some great things for us all to be considering. I know there's some questions there on Twitter. Um, we will 
ourselves will be sitting here looking and showing Alice in the tweets that have some questions and we'll probably sit here for the next half an hour looking at some of these tweets and answering them so thank you very much and um, um, for joining the session and we shall look forward to seeing you again in, the mo in a month's time for the next, next EDGE talk so thank you, goodbye and see you next time